Uh, just a slight word of explanation first. Um, I'm in an unusual position because in this past week I've had quite a lot of back pain and the safest thing for me to do today is to sit down. And as I've said to some of my brethren, well, there is a biblical precedent because uh, I don't want to compare myself with the Lord, but when he preached the Sermon on the Mount, if you read the beginning of Matthew 5, he sat down and taught them. So uh, I'm doing nothing unusual in that sense. I don't like having to do it, but uh, that's the way it is at the moment to try and allow my back to recover, having rather overdone things and a few unwise things last week. Well, I'm going to turn now to just a few verses from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and I'm reading verses 14 to 17. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Well, we turn now to our first hymn, and it's number 245 in the New Christian Hymns, but of course displayed on the front. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvellous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvellous, how wonderful was my Saviour's love to me. So we stand as soon as the music begins.
excuse me for that. Um, before we come to a PowerPoint that introduces my reading, we'll turn to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for this reminder in the hymn that we've just sung of your love for us, of the reminder in your word that you so loved this world that you gave your only begotten Son in your love for us, that you gave your only begotten Son to pay the price for our sins in order that we might be redeemed, that we might be set free. We thank you for a love which is beyond our understanding and a love which we've only barely begun to realize and to understand perhaps in a measure and we pray that more and more you would grant us to realize just how much you have loved us and how much you are lord and savior jesus christ the greatness of your love that you came into this world for our salvation that you were willing to be nailed to a cross in paying the price for our sin forsaken by your father in a way that is incomprehensible to us in order that we might never be forsaken, every one of us who truly believes. We thank you, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, that you paid the full price for our sin. And that is the reason why we're able to come to you now, even this morning, to remember these things, and why we can come into the presence of our God and Father, knowing that we are accepted in the Beloved, saved through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, redeemed by the one who died to pay the price for our sins, and though we deserved all of the eternity of hell and total separation forevermore from the God of creation, from the God who has made us, yet in your love, your mercy, your compassion, undeserved by us, you loved us in order to redeem us and with such tremendous cost. Be with us this morning as we think about these things on this Good Friday as a special day for focusing particularly on all that has been done to accomplish our salvation. And may it be that as we think on these things more and more, we might grow in love for the God who has first loved us. And we pray that you will forgive us for our many sins. We are guilty day by day. Still, even as long-standing believers, we are guilty. But we thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby we are cleansed afresh and we are able to enter into the presence of you, the eternal God and Father, because of your Son, whoever li lives to make intercession for us. So be with us now. We ask it in and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we come to a PowerPoint, and uh, unfortunately I have to twist a little bit to make sure what I say is with the appropriate picture. It's very short. It's not specifically for young people, but... Uh, I hope it just helps us all. Before I come to my reading from the book of Isaiah, now Isaiah himself, we can see there um, what are generally taken to be the dates when he lived and when he wrote that great book, Isaiah, which is one of the very great books of the Old Testament, to say the least, revealed to him by God. And uh, as one Israeli friend said to me many years ago, the book that has the most connecting links between the Old Testament and the New so going on to the second slide, well, what I want to show you in a minute uh, is a picture of um, what's called the Great Isaiah Scroll, and uh, it was discovered in one of the caves by the Dead Sea. So you can see there, I've highlighted where the, well, you can see where the Dead Sea is, and um, the Dead Sea with the Galilean hills above it, not the Galilean hills, sorry, the Judean hills. And uh, yes, we've been there as a family back in 1987, and uh, we have floated on the water. You don't swim, you just float. But uh, it's, uh, it's much shrunk these days, but this is where there was a community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they were found, if we'll move on to the next picture, in a cave very close to the Dead Sea. We call them the Qumran Caves. And then there was a whole community which we take to be some sort of monastic community nearby. We just don't know for certain. But uh, you can see on the left the caves. An Arab boy discovered it by mistake, if you like, by accident, in 1947-48, when he threw a stone into a cave and he heard something tinkling and went in and found these remarkable, very old scrolls. Many of them have proved to be Old Testament uh, copies of parts of the Old Testament and inside a cave looking towards the Dead Sea itself, the bottom picture. 
and then the next slide. Well, there you have a picture of what's called the Great Isaiah Scroll. Um, the top shows you the way it's set up in the centre of the Shrine of the Book, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And then the Great Isaiah Scroll, almost complete in, uh, it's as a copy of the Book of Isaiah, um, is around that display cabinet or that circular display cabinet in the centre of the Shrine of the Book. I think that periodically they remove it very carefully for one reason or another, but then they'll always put the authorities a replica in it. But you see the date of that scroll, Great Isaiah Scroll. Yeah, there are certain textual differences with Isaiah as we have it in the Hebrew today, but very insignificant differences. And this Great Isaiah Scroll, it was written somewhere between 150 and 100 BC, before the time of Jesus. And yet, I think the next scroll, the next picture, well, you find Isaiah 53 in there, and Isaiah 53 in the Dead Sea Scroll, and slightly different ways that people translate it into English. It gives us the meaning that we're going to look at today. It fits in with all that I want to say about Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53. Um, you know, we've been there as a family. It's quite extraordinary to see it. To me, that was the great highlight of our um, visit as a family there back in 1987. So if you ever do go to Israel as a tourist, the Shrine of the Book, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Well, we'll turn now from that to the reading of the scriptures. And I'm going to read from Isaiah, starting in chapter 52, and then going on into chapter 52, 53, where the main focus of my attention is this morning. But these last verses, chapter 52 from verse 13 onwards, um, they really, they set the scene for chapter 53. And uh, they help us in, uh, if you like, understanding what is explained more fully in chapter 53. So Isaiah 52, starting at verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations. And that's the word of uh, cleansing by sacrifice. He shall sprinkle many nations Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall go up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You could say, surely he's borne our sins, carried them away, and also borne our sicknesses. He died to deliver us from sin and all its consequences. So surely he's borne our griefs, pierced through for our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, 
and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge, or rather, he shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, may God bless that word to our hearts, and we'll turn back to it a bit later on. Let's turn once more to God in prayer. We thank you, our gracious eternal God, for the Bible, for the scriptures, which are your word of truth. We thank you for the many wonderful things that they say, but particularly that there are so many prophecies in the Old Testament and the Hebrew scriptures, which are so vividly and wonderfully fulfilled in your eternal Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and not least this great prophecy in Isaiah of the suffering servant of God. But we thank you that you sent your Son into this world for our salvation, and that we have this particular day in the year when we can remember in a special way all that has been accomplished for us in the Lord Jesus Christ as he died on the cross bearing our sins, that all we have, like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned everyone to his own way, and yet you, the Lord, have laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We thank you for the one who was pierced through for our transgressions, who was crushed for our iniquities, and by whose stripes we are made whole. And we thank you for the certainty of our salvation, because the Lord Jesus Christ paid the price for us in full, not in part, but in whole, that all of our sins were atoned for, in order that every one of us who truly believes might have a sure and certain salvation, because in no way is our salvation of us and our own efforts and achievements, but it is by your grace, the eternal, the living God and Father of grace, in and through your Son, who in love came into this world for our salvation. And we pray for so many who have not heard this gospel of salvation, even in this land of ours where once the Bible was very widely known and read in schools and was treated with respect, and even on the television where the Christian faith was treated with respect and in the media. And we pray that you might turn again the hearts of the people, that there might be many in our own land who would seek again to know the truths of the gospel and the truth about the one who came into this world for our salvation and apart from whom there is no salvation at all because there is no other name given under, heaven, given under heaven by which men must be saved, namely the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for our salvation, but we long to see more and more come into the way of salvation and that by your grace and by the working of your Holy Spirit in this land, you would deliver many more out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear Son. And we pray that in particular for our leaders at this time, our leaders in government and the leaders in the separate assemblies in Scotland and in Wales and in Northern Ireland as well. And we pray that you would turn the hearts of all the leaders back to your truth, back to the principles of true morality, back to the Ten Commandments and all that they imply, and that there would be a return to your word and a return to the gospel in our land. Open the eyes of the blind, we pray, that they might see and know the truth that is in the gospel and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And wherever the gospel is being preached today and the scripture passages about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for our sakes may speak to the hearts of many in many parts of this world and that the hearts and minds of many today and also on this coming Sunday, Easter Sunday, that the hearts and minds of many might be opened to know the truth of the gospel and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and find in him their salvation. Send your word forth, we pray, over this period in a renewed way and bring light and life to many, many people. And we ask all of these prayers now in and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I'm not sure if the microphone is still working. Oh, it is, yeah. Uh, that's good. Well, we're going to turn now to our next hymn, which is number 235. Hymn number 235 in New Christian Hymns, Give Me a Sight, O Saviour. 
of your wondrous love for me, of the love that brought you down to earth to die on Calvary. So let's stand as soon as the music uh, starts. now to the passage that uh, I read a little bit earlier on and it's particularly Isaiah chapter 53. Now in the book of Acts chapter 8 verse 26 and the verses around there there's an incident that relates very directly to this particular passage Isaiah 53 and Philip the evangelist well he was in Samaria and then the Holy Spirit directed him to go southwards towards of all places Gaza because uh, he knew that, uh, oh well, the Holy Spirit knew, and then this man eventually found that there was a man who had been in the land who was returning to his own country, an Ethiopian royal court official. He's called the eunuch in the account in the uh, uh, book of Acts chapter 8. But what that really means is that um, he was a high-up official, he was a servant in uh, the royal palace in Ethiopia. Now when Philip caught up with him in his chariot, the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian invited him up into the chariot and he was reading, and he was reading from the book of Isaiah. And at this point he happened to be reading Isaiah 53. And as we have it in the New Testament, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. And who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth." So Philip said to the Ethiopian, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian, his reply, he said, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Well, of course, he had no reason that he should be able to understand. But that's the question. 
Of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself? Some other man? Well, of whom does the prophet say it? That's the key, qui, sorry, it's the key question. But in fact, you could say there are three questions wrapped up in this. Who is this servant, the suffering servant? Why did he suffer in this particular way? And what exactly did he accomplish? Who is he? Why did he suffer? What did he accomplish? So the very first question there is, who is this servant? Now, Isaiah 53 is pretty obvious. It portrays a suffering servant, and very clearly a suffering servant. And yet, strangely, it seems that ancient Judaism, going back to the time of Jesus and before and immediately after, um, there was no idea of a suffering servant in the true sense of the word. And... Uh, it seems that people were very puzzled by Isaiah 53. And well, when Jesus, when he talked to his disciples in Mark chapter 9 about how he would suffer and die and rise again, we're told they were puzzled. They didn't understand what he was talking about in any way. And that seems to be the problem of that time, that uh, in general the Jewish world didn't understand. And uh, there's a very ancient Jewish, well, it's called Targum, and we might call it a paraphrase of the scriptures from uh, Hebrew into Aramaic, used very much in the synagogues of that time. And there's this paraphrase of Isaiah 53, probably from the first century AD, after the time of Jesus, but still in the first century. And yes, it takes Isaiah 53 as a prophecy of the Messiah, but it portrays him as an exalted, proud, aggressive, fighting person. How it manages to do that, I don't know. I'm probably thinking of a man called Bar Kokhba, who was proclaimed Messiah and he fought against the Romans and led the Jewish armies against the Romans in 132 to 135 AD, and they were slaughtered, they were defeated. And the Romans, um, well, they finally dispersed most of the people from the land. But that was the sort of idea that it seems that the ancient Jewish world had. Now today, again may I quote Jewish commentators, the very common view is that the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is not an individual man, it's the whole nation of Israel, that they're all the suffering servant. That's an interesting viewpoint. Um, many, many years ago, not long after we'd arrived in London as a family, um, I don't know what year exactly, but we arrived in 1985, a very orthodox Jewish man from Golders Green was put into contact with us and I agreed that he could come and uh, visit us in our own home. Very orthodox man. And he wanted to discuss this particular chapter because he'd picked up one of our booklets uh, that uh, I and my fellow workers had been given to people on Isaiah 53. And uh, he wanted to insist to me that the book was completely wrong and Christians were wrong, that Isaiah 53 is about the Jewish people in all of their sufferings through all of the centuries and, well, millennia. And so I pointed him, for example, to verse 8, where the suffering servant is clearly one Jewish man who died for the rest of the Jewish people. Verse 8, for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. It's an individual amongst a crowd of people. Well, there are all sorts of ideas that have been put forward about who this suffering servant is. Was it Isaiah or Jeremiah or whatever? But I don't want to go through those. Um, there have been these various ideas. But really, when you look at Isaiah chapter 53 thoroughly and carefully, there's only one person in the whole of history who fits this chapter detail by detail, and that's the person of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was rejected and suffered and died as he did. Verse 3, where we read that he would be despised and rejected by men. And well, we know that that was the case, that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was despised and rejected by many men long before he was put on the cross. But finally, when he was put on the cross, and we see how so many of his Jewish brethren despised and rejected him. Not all, but many. Verse 4, where we read that the servant would carry or bear away our griefs and our sorrows. Or we could translate that as our sicknesses and our pains. He died for our sins. He died to carry away and to get rid of all of the consequences of our sins. Finally, to deliver us not only from sin, but from everything that follows from sin. These are ailing bodies of ours which are getting older. And sometimes when your body's not so well, <laughs> you look forward much more to what is to come in the resurrection. But that's why he died 
to deliver us from all of this, dying for our sin and to deliver us from all of its consequences. And yes, he bore our griefs and sorrows, our sicknesses, our um, illnesses, our sins. And one day he will wipe away every tear from our eyes because he died in this way on the cross. And so, verse 5, we're told that he would be wounded, or very literally, pierced through for our transgressions. That's much more vivid. Well, on the cross, he was very vividly and in reality pierced through. He was nailed to the cross, his hands and his feet. He had to wear a crown of thorns, and this because he was paying the price for our sin. So he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was pierced on the cross because of your sin and my sin. We need to remember that. Verse 7, we read that the servant opened not his mouth. He didn't open his mouth to defend his innocence. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 12, for example, we see how Jesus, he didn't answer his accusers, we're told. He answered nothing. Various false accusations, but he answered nothing. He opened not his mouth. And so verse 7 again, we're told that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't protest. He didn't resist. He went to trial. Without protesting, he was led to the slaughter, to his death on the cross. And that's what the Gospels show us in the final week of the Lord Jesus and in that final period of trial and crucifixion. Verse 8, the servant would be cut off from the land of the living. In other words, that he would die on the cross. That the servant at this point, we're told, that he would be cut off completely from the whole land of the living. But why, in verse 8? For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Cut off from the land of the living on the cross because he was dying for our sin. And that was the price of our sin, that he was cut off from the land of the living. And then, uh, well, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 says this very clearly, doesn't it? Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Well, according to Isaiah 53, as one example. And then verse 9, they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Well, Jesus was sentenced as if he was a criminal. He would have been consigned in the normal way to a criminal's grave. But no, at the last moment, a rich man called Joseph of Arimathea, he asked permission to remove the body of Jesus from the cross and he buried the body of Jesus in his own rock-hewn tomb, completely unused, but somewhere in or near to Jerusalem. That's how Jesus fulfilled this particular um, prophecy in Isaiah. And again, with that very orthodox man, I asked him, how can you say, if it's all about the Jewish people, they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich in his death? I said, that fits exactly what happened to Jesus. And he didn't contradict the point. And then uh, looking at verse 9 again, and again when this very orthodox Jewish man, let's say he, he argued like a Jewish man banging the table and shouting his point at me, but uh, I can assure you it's a Jewish way, not aggressive, not angry, it's just the way they like to debate. And at the end of it all, he did thank me for having a wonderful conversation. So, you know, it was in a very friendly spirit. But um, when um, this Jewish man insisted that Israel was the servant, I asked him if it could ever be said of the Jewish nation or any other nation or any individual Jewish person or any one of the rest of us, he's done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Aren't we all guilty? No violence? Well, sometimes our words can be very violent. What we say can really hurt other people, and we can seek, speak very softly to hurt other people, and we can be violent in soft-spoken speech, to say the least, or what we sometimes call an assassin's smile. You know, it's that sort of thing, where we can be guilty in that way. Nor was there any deceit in his mouth. What does James say? That if we can bridle our tongue then we are perfect. Well, have any of us ever succeeded in bridling our tongues fully? If you're honest, you know that you haven't and I haven't. And so I said to this man, well, surely this is a perfect man. And that doesn't fit anyone except Jesus. The only one who could ever say as he did, which of you 
convicts me of sin. And nobody could. False charges, but nobody could charge him with any real sin in terms of the law of God. But again, in verse 8, the servant would be cut off from the land of the living. But yes, look at verse 10. He shall prolong his days. Death and resurrection, it's here. That Jesus would die while he fulfilled this. He died on the cross. And while we remember it, particularly on Sunday, when he rose again from the grave. He would die. He would also rise again. And what are the facts of history? The eyewitness testimonies of the New Testament and the surrounding facts of history, they all demonstrate and corroborate and prove the resurrection, and especially the four Gospels. And I might say a little bit more about that, God willing, on Sunday morning. But then, verse 11, the servant's death would justify many. In other words, Jesus, by his death, he's justified us. He's borne our guilt. He's reconciled us to God. He's paid the price for our sins. And in the court of God, we are declared not guilty. Amen. And that's the crucial point. He should justify many. And if we're true believers this morning, if we truly repented and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're justified. We're reconciled to God. We have access into the presence of God. And day by day by day, if we confess our sins again and again, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And that's the point. So the servant's death would justify many. And as Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And you see how vividly this passage is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again and again, when I've quoted it in the past to Jewish friends, oh, that's all about Jesus. That's about the death of Jesus. No, I don't believe that. I only believe in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And then I've shown them the Old Testament, yes, it's all there, written about 700 years before the time of Jesus. And uh, it's a remarkable prophecy, but there are so many others. And this prophecy, along with many others, it's a challenge to non-believers. You've got to believe. The Bible is a supernatural book. These prophecies given hundreds of years before they were fulfilled in Jesus, so many of them, well, you've either got to explain them away or you've got to face up to them honestly and accept the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as being what it is, the gospel of salvation, and that he is the eternal saviour who was sent into this world for our salvation. If you look at all the prophecies, not least this prophecy, with a clear mind and an open mind, you have to accept that Jesus is the God-given saviour who died for our sins. That's the challenge. Bless Pascal in his uh, famous collection of thoughts called the Pensee. He was a great mathematician, one of the greatest. And he wrote in the 17th century, I quote, The prophecies are the strongest proof of Jesus Christ. Well, it's a challenge. And if you haven't accepted the gospel and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, take the challenge. Look at those prophecies. Look back at Isaiah 53 and realize what it implies that you need to turn to this one who died for our sins in repentance and faith for salvation. And as believers, well, it reassures us that the Bible is God's word of truth. So we can rest our whole lives and trust our whole lives to the word of God and all of its promises and all that it says, God's word in the Bible is true. But then there's a second question, and I won't be quite so lengthy because in the first question, I was dealing very much with the exposition of the passage. But the second question, why did he suffer? Well, I've touched on that, obviously, and it overlaps. But Isaiah 53, chapter 9, it makes it clear that God's servant, Jesus, of course, in no way did he deserve to die, because he'd done no violence. Nor was there any deceit in his mouth. It's so clear, a perfect man. And in verse 11, he's very clearly called by God, my righteous servant, in the sense that his whole life was perfect and righteous with God. Well, he was the eternal son of God. So why did God's righteous servant die? Well, those very familiar verses, which I will read again, um, verses 4 to 6 of Isaiah 53. Surely he's borne our griefs 
and carried our sorrows. And yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was bruised, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, peace with God. He died for our peace. And so by his stripes on the cross we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It's so clear, isn't it? That's why he died, and he was pierced for our transgressions. A few more comments I need to make here. Why did he suffer? Well, let's put it this way. When the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for our sins in this way, he showed us the seriousness of our sin. We so often take sin lightly, so often we treat it as a, a truly a trivial thing and we so readily excuse ourselves, don't we? We've all done it. And we like to pass the blame, just like Adam and Eve, who blamed one another and then blamed God. It's, it's in our nature. But we make light of sin. But we have to remember, he was crushed for our iniquities. He was crushed for our sins, even the little ones. But we cast off the burden of God's commandments so easily we forget them. And there are times when we do things that, well, we know deep down it's not right and we shouldn't. But then we must remember that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every single one. All that we are guilty of. And then, as I've said already, we do oppress and we afflict others with our words. Even if it's with an assassin smile or soft-spoken words. But really it means to hurt the other people. But for all of this, he was oppressed. We afflict others, we oppress others. But he was oppressed because of it, and he was afflicted. And we might be tempted to think that sin is pleasure. Sin is real life. You know, we can enjoy sin, and, well, just this one at the moment. But it's so clear, he was cut off from the land of the living for our sin, and for every single one of them. And we enjoy our sins, but because we enjoy our sins, even in a small way, because we enjoy our sins, he was put to grief as Isaiah says. And again, it shows us the seriousness of our sins. So Isaiah 53 is a call. Think about all that's said here and think about it, the fact that your sin, my sin, was laid upon him. And it shows us the seriousness of our sin in every way. And we can't count sin as a light thing when we realise that it costs the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a call to repent of sin for the first time, perhaps if you're not yet a believer, if you've not yet repented and trusted in him. But as believers, we still fail to acknowledge our sin and to learn what it means to feel real grief for our sin and to seek day by day to be cleansed for our sin and by the grace of God, more and more, to turn away from our sin. So it's a call to look to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and then day by day, by his grace, to turn away from the sins that so easily beset us and sometimes when I've been out on the doors and I see a Jewish mezuzah on the door and I point to the mezuzah and I say um, do you know what's in the mezuzah or well, most do um, words from Deuteronomy you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart you shall love your neighbour as yourself and I say um, have you ever loved the Lord your God with all your heart well no have you always loved your neighbour as yourself well, no, I haven't. I say, well, no, neither have I. So we're sinners. We've broken God's commandments. But I know that God forgives me and that I will go to heaven, not because I think I'm good enough for God, because I know I'm not, and I've not loved him as I should have, and I've not loved my neighbour as myself. But Jesus died for my sin, and he pardons my sin, and I will know that I will have eternal life because I trust in Jesus, who died because I've broken God's commandments. And that's the point. Well, then I come to my third main point, my last main point. What did he accomplish? Verse 11, we see that the servant triumphed over sin by his death. <coughs> Verse 11, for he, that is God, shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's a triumph over sin. He died. And he triumphed over the sin that condemns us in order that we might live. Again, in effect, I'm repeating the point, but just a slightly different angle. The point is, the wages of sin is death. 
That's why we have dying bodies. And that's why those of us who are true believers, yes, we'll still die physically, because we're not perfect in this world, but we look forward to the resurrection when our bodies will be made perfect. The wages of sin is death, that's the point. So when he died on the cross, he suffered in our place, and he opened the way for us to be pardoned by God, to be right with God. And then verse 10, the servant triumphed over death by his death and resurrection. He triumphed over sin by his death, and now we find that he triumphed over death by his death and resurrection. Verse 10, when you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall prolong his days. He rose again. But the important point back in verse 5, by his stripes we are, made, we are healed. Healed spiritually, but ultimately in the resurrection, healed physically. Because the Lord Jesus Christ died physically. And in his body and his spirit he bore our sin and paid the price for our sin. And by his death, finally, those of us who truly trust in him, we will be delivered from death and have eternal life in a new creation in redeemed bodies that will never die and never suffer again. Again, it's something to look forward to when you get older, you realise more and more these bodies do wear out, but one day the resurrection, because Jesus died and rose again. Death is life's most awful reality. We can't escape it, unless the Lord returns first. But it is the most awful reality. One by one, we see our loved ones go to the grave. But then our own turn comes as well. And it is an awful reality. But as one hymn writer puts it reassuringly, Jesus lives, thy terrors now can, O death, no more appall us. Jesus lives, by this we know, thou, O grave, canst not enthrall us. It can't keep us. We'll rise from the grave. That's a sure and certain Christian hope. And then verse 12, Jesus, the servant, triumphs over Satan, and he wins back for us all of the lost blessings that we lost in the fall. All of the things that are forfeited because of our sin as individuals and as a human race. Well, he wins them back for us through his death and resurrection. Verse 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Many, a huge number of people that he paid the price for when he died for our sins. But here we have a reference to this servant's victory over the enemy and the whole kingdom of the enemy. Christ, in his death and resurrection, he dealt Satan's kingdom a decisive blow. Yes, Satan is still active, but the Lord, in his death and his resurrection, he dealt Satan a decisive blow. And therefore the gospel is advancing in the world. And one day the Lord will return to restore all things. But by his death and his resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ, he shares the spoils. He restores to us what Satan has taken away from us in, his, in our sin and because of our sin. He delivers us from Satan's kingdom and he restores all that we had lost and more. The blessings that we receive as believers go far beyond what Adam and Eve knew in the very first instance before they fell. Christ's victory in his death and resurrection. Well, it's an ongoing victory because, well, we're saved. Those of us who truly believed, that's part of his victory over sin and Satan, delivered out of Satan's kingdom. And as the gospel progresses, in other lands much more than here, it shows that... Uh, well, Christ is victorious over sin and Satan, and even when there's much opposition and persecution against Christians and the gospel, still the gospel progresses because Jesus died and rose again in victory over Satan and his kingdom. Very reassuring truth, isn't it? Many years ago, a Christian scholar wrote a booklet on Isaiah 53, and this is the booklet I referred to earlier, which we used to give out to Jewish contacts and friends. He describes this remarkable prophecy, Isaiah 53, as, I quote, the challenge of the ages. It's a challenge to everyone who doesn't believe the gospel and hasn't committed their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, you've either got to explain this prophecy away and all the others in the Old Testament with them, or if you're honest and you face up to what they really say, then in all honesty, you should repent 
believe the gospel, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. So Isaiah 53 is a challenge that the suffering servant died for our sins and if we look to him in repentance and faith, we'll be justified, pardoned, saved forever. But this is a challenge. You've got to explain it away if you're going to refuse the gospel. Well, Isaiah 53 calls those of us who are believers, this is my last point, day by day, to confess our sins, to turn from our sins more and more by the grace of God, the sins by which we crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we sing it sometimes, mine, mine the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. That's the great hymn, O Sacred Head So Wounded. But let me finish with um, the words of one hymn that we have in Christian hymns, though we're not going to finish with it, where we sometimes sing, Pardoned is all my sin at Calvary. Cleansed is my heart within at Calvary. Now robes of praise I wear. Gone are my grief and care. Christ bore my burdens there at Calvary. Wondrous his love for me at Calvary. Glorious his victory at Calvary. Vanquished are death and hell. Oh, let his praises swell. Ever my tongue shall tell of Calvary. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. We thank you, our gracious God, for this wonderful passage that we've studied and really we've only skated over very much the surface of it so much that is said <clears throat> we pray that more and more as we read this and as we read the gospel records of how the son of god suffered and died for our sins in love for us that more and more we might have a sense of wonder at the love of the lord jesus christ at the wonder of the eternal god and father in giving your son at the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ is love for us in dying on the cross to bear away our sin, in rising again, conquering our sin, conquering Satan and conquering the grave. And may these truths impress themselves more and more on our minds and the more and more we might appreciate the wonder of the greatness of the infinite love of God who so blesses us and so offers us a wonderful salvation against all that we deserve, we who deserve only condemnation, and yet through the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, saved by his blood forevermore. And we ask these things now and we pray this in and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We turn now to our final hymn, which is number 261, as you see, in New Christian Hymns. And... Uh, one of those hymns that many of us have sung from childhood onwards. And uh, it's a very straightforward but very beautiful hymn which expresses these truths so well. Number 261. There is a green hill far away outside a city wall where the dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. Oh, dearly, dearly has he loved. And we must love him too and trust in his redeeming blood and try his works to do. So let's rise as soon as the music begins.
And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. 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 <clears throat>